It's a special meeting of the Committee of the Whole, 04-18, and predominantly for 2018 budget. On Monday, March 5th, again at 5.30 p.m. Are there any addendum items? Do we lose a clerk here? You got a clerk? Sure. No, there are no addendum no items. Items. Thank Mr. you. Uh, I didn't attain a motion to confirm the agenda. Moved by Councillor Bodner, second by Councillor Doucette. All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Are there any disclosures of interest this evening? There being none, uh, so indicate, please. We have a delegation tonight. Uh, it's Mario Mad Madia. He's Vice President of Finance, and Catherine Ann White, Vice President of Health, Fitness, and Aquatics, on behalf of the YMC of Nanker. And Sharon Schultz as well, who's the center manager here at the at the valet center. Could you come forward to the, uh, the podium? And there's a little mark there. Ah, you got it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, good evening, Mayor Maloney, uh, council members, and city of Port Cabin Port Coven staff. My, my name is Mario Medea. I'm the vice president of finance for the YMCA of Niagara. As the mayor mentioned, also with me is uh, Kathy Ann White, Vice President of Health, Fitness, and Aquatics for the YMCA, and Sharon Siltz, the Port Coburn Center Manager. Uh, on behalf of the YMCA of Niagara, we thank you for this opportunity to present our budget request. Um, at the February 12, 2018 Council meeting, uh, some of my colleagues presented a uh, report to Council of the first five years of our partnership at the uh, Vale Health and Wellness Center. As a matter of background to our budget request, we would like to present some of the highlights of that meeting. And I will turn it over to Kathy Ann to just go through some of the highlights. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mario. Good evening. The YMCA and the City of Port Coburn agreed on an operational agreement in June of 2012. And seven months later, in February of 2013, the Vail Health and Wellness Center uh, was open to the public. This partnership leverages the YMCA's expertise in programming to offer a health and wellness experience to the Port Coburn community. August 2017 marked year five of this successful partnership. As you can see from some of the statistics on this next slide, over the past five years, the YMCA has been able to achieve some significant milestones in Port Coburn. This has included employing more than 75 staff, engaging more than 99 volunteers annually, supporting participation in swim lessons for more than 480 children and youth each week, and engaging children and youth in more than 2,000 YMCA day camp days. Our YMCA has continued to have a significant impact on the Port Coburn community, increasing access by providing financial assistance to more than 400 individuals per year so that they can participate. The value of this financial assistance has amounted to more than $300,030 in this five-year period. At this point, I'd turn it back to Mario to discuss a little bit more of our financial request. Um, thank you, Kathy Ann. <clears throat> On this next slide, I, ju I just want to highlight uh, a, a few points. As you can see over this five-year period, the net contribution has varied between a surplus of 15000 to a deficit of, of 9000 So almost, you know, break-even, zero contribution um, for, for each year. In addition, in years three and four, the operating service fund was reduced by $20,000 based on st strong financial results from the prior year. That $20,000 would reduce the operating fund for the city in the years following. These results, we believe, demonstrate that the YMCA is committed to be fiscally responsible. Unfortunately, as we move forward into the next budget year, the YMCA, you know, in total, is facing a significant challenge with Bill 148, which increased minimum wages 21 percent from 1160 to, to 14 dollars um, 
as indicated on the slide, the impact specifically for the Port Colvin YMCA in the current fiscal year is an increase of cost of $55,000 for the YMCA. The next slide is our budget presentation for the current fiscal year. Um, this was discussed with the city staff in a, in a prior meeting. Um, and you know, th this includes membership fees that we increased October 1st, 2017 from three to 5% in anticipation of the increasing costs. And this also factors in year to date results, um, what we're seeing. You know, the YMCA will continue to monitor costs and look for opportunities for savings, but at this point we are trending towards a deficit of the magnitude of 48,000. And as you can see, this 48,000 is more than any of the previous five years. As a, as a result, the, the, y, the YMCA is requesting additional assistance from the city. Um, in amount of 50% of this projected deficit minus a prior year surplus in year five of, of 1800. So approximately 22,000 is, is what we are requesting here today. The YMCA continues to be grateful for the strong partnership with the city of Port Colvin. We will continue to work in collaboration with the city of Port Colvin around the future operational and capital investments required to maintain a safe, relevant facility and ensure high quality experiences for many years to come. We welcome any questions you may have at this time. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah. Are there any questions, uh, Councilor Riders? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you to the presenter. Thanks for coming tonight. Um, so my question would be, um, so this is the budget request for 2017-18 so what do you anticipate for like 18, 19, and then 19, sure. 20, and? Yeah, that, that's, that's a fair, fair question. Uh, I mean, Bill 148 for the YC IMCA is more than just raising minimum wages up to the required amount. It requires a whole compensation review. And we started that with this initial phase of phase one. We haven't completed it for the upcoming increase in January. So at this point, uh, Councilor, I, I can't answer your question specifically. We continue to evaluate, work with the city, and determine the cost. What, what I can tell you is that the increase we just went through was 21%. The increase anticipated in, in well, actually happening in January 18 is 7%. So we expect this year to be the most significant okay, impact. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions of Mario? Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to items for consideration. <coughs> Councilors, please deal with that. Does anyone wish to pull items one or two? There be none, but someone like to make a motion to accept items one and two. Yes, Councilor Doucette. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you to whoever can answer this. I understand the logic behind it, and, and I read the report, and the difficulties that the last session created, especially for the ICE, um, when we initially built it, we didn't want anything up on the boards and the walls as much as possible. This will change that. So how bad is it going to be? And the reason I'm asking that is I don't, wouldn't want it to return to what we had at West, West Side Arena, which is things all over the place, everywhere. Um, and I understand why the businesses do it, but there's also uh, an, an aesthetic type of uh, uh, look that we're, we're, we're trying to get here. And this will, if we're not careful, destroy that aesthetic type of look. So I don't know who can answer it. Mr. Sanas. Okay. Uh, three, Mr. Mayor. I'll, I'll start, uh, Councillor Doucette. 
Um, the reason we brought forward this report um, is it's been something that um, uh, we've been discussing at the staff level for probably a year or so. Um, but basically in looking at our overall budget and, and initially, you're correct, uh, the, when we first brought, uh, uh, brought the Valet Health and Wellness Center on board is that we didn't want anything on the boards and, and, and so on. Um, in looking at it five years down, down the road now, what we're looking at is opportunities for increase in, in revenues for, for the municipality. So with that said, we, we do look at other municipalities and what, what they, they do, obviously, and uh, a lot of them do have some level of advertising both on the boards and on um, and on on walls and other uh, and other areas too could be garbage containers uh, anything. So what we um, anticipated is let's let's bring it back to council and see if uh, based on the fact that there is uh, an opportunity to increase our revenues, which would then also reduce the the uh, the subsidy of, of of the whole center, um, would that be something that that council would in, entail? The, the report is written to a certain degree just to bring it back to council to see if, what the appetite of council is. It's obviously definitely um, council's decision as to one, whether or not we want to uh, continue or, or, or to go down this road for advertising. And if we do, to, to direct staff to go back and, and develop a, a plan and a, an advertising program and determine uh, and bring that back to council for approval and it would be also entail anything that council would uh, direct staff tonight it could be um, you only want uh, you know 10 10 uh, advertising on, on the boards uh, you only want you know 10 advertising on on walls that type of thing so it would be at the direction of council as to how far we really want to go with this um, there is potential that I think revenues that we're leaving on the table that will help overall our, um, our, our, our revenue situation and our, and our tax levy in, in, in the end. So it's a matter of what do we really want to do? What does council want to do? Um, there is some advertising we do on monitors and things like that. Um, but obviously the bigger bang for your buck are definitely advertising on the boards because they're more visible, advertising on the walls because they're more visible, doesn't mean that you have to put advertising on every little space that's in the, in the building or on the boards, but to some degree um, it can be in, in both arenas, um, it could be on one side versus the other side, so there's a lot of different, I think, opportunities and, and levels that we could go with, and it's a matter of if we get some direction from council, then um, staff can come back with an advertising policy, come back with a, an advertising package that hopefully would be, we'd be able to then draw on revenue because we do have a number of businesses that I know have, have come forward and saying, we'd love to be advertising on the boards um, or, or in, the, in the facility someplace, uh, somehow. So it's a matter of how far we want to take it. Um, with regard to the boards themselves, I'm not sure if, if Paul wanted to speak on the, the new type of um, the new type of um, advertising as to what they put on the boards. Um, right now, the boards are getting sort of blackened up by puck marks and all that, which doesn't look good either. And with advertising on there, that sort of covers that part of it uh, to a certain degree. But with the new technology now of what they put on the boards, it's sort of a strip and peel, I believe. I'm not sure. Paul has anything else on that? Yeah. So it's basically up to council how far we want to go with it. Thank you, Mr. Ness. For the record, could we have uh, this recommendation moved and seconded? Moved by Councilor Yusset, seconded by Councilor Elliott. Further discussion. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have no problems with putting some up, but I don't want it to become to the extent that we had on West Side, West Side Arena where every panel had something. And the minute someone dropped their funding, <clears throat> then there was a white panel that showed up. And then, um, that would be my concern. And, and I think that whatever policy we come up with, 
we have to be able to find it and manage it. Just like you say you have businesses now that would like to do it, if you put everything out, then you don't have a demand for it. You have to be careful of that as well. And we have two arenas to cover. Okay, so I, I think that I have no problems with taking a look at it, coming back with a manageable um, uh, policy that will help add some advertising and bring some revenues up, but to make sure that it is not so extensive that it becomes onerous on, you, you, you almost need one person to manage it all every month because you don't know who's going to show up and try to, you, you don't want that. You want to be able to say, well, sorry, we don't have any more left for this year. I think that that's critical, and I think it's also critical that we make sure that it is aesthetically pleasing uh, to, to um, the people that are in the arena. Okay, and I think that's, that's also extremely important. Um, if it just looks like just a bunch of things all over the place, then it's, it, it's not nice anymore. At, at okay. this stage, I believe this is what the recommendation yeah. suggests, that we'll develop the policy. Develop the policy and, and bring it back. back to us uh, yeah. for final adjudication. Yep. Mr. Bodner and then Mr. Elliott. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you to, well, Peter or staff in general. But uh, this is exactly what I'm looking for from staff is ideas on how we can maximize what we have and um, you know I think if you go to most arenas you're gonna see some form of advertising and I know we're you know if we stage it like you said and we get it in you know you bring us a presentation of what the boards would look like and if you and when you're doing that can you can you show us examples of other arenas that have this on so we can actually you know see something and say we don't like that or we like that but I think you're right, we're leaving money on the table, mm -hmm. and I think it's fair to, you know, the people that are footing the bill that, um, you know, we look at every opportunity. Um, so thanks for bringing that forward. Thank you, Mr. Bonner. Mr. Elliott. Thank you, Mayor. Through you to Peter. Um, yeah, like the other two councillors have said, revenue generation, I think, is paramount. Because right now, what's the subsidy for uh, Valet that, we're, that the city contributes? Oh, I thought you'd have that right on the tip of your tongue. Because you know, because you know, this I, was, I figured you'd figure it out. I'd, I'd ask, <laughs> and I and, and I would promote. I believe it's about one point. I think we're at about one, at least around one million. If I'm not mistaken, but I will tell you in one second. In the meantime, um, one of the things um, while I'm looking for that is the um, the idea is that staff. There are two way two ways of doing this. Also, one is. Um, that staff uh, undertake and, and manage the um, the advertising program. And the other is that uh, a third party, and some municipalities do have that. They have a third party come in. They're the ones that go out and, and uh, get the advertising and so on. And then they have there's a shared uh, revenue uh, between the municipality and the uh, and the third party that goes out and and, and gets the uh, advertising. Um, right now our um, Overall subsidy is, um, is about a million dollars. Okay, that's that's where I thought it was. So I would I would look, you know what, if we can drive revenue stream through, uh, and I get through board sales for sure. And I can understand Councillor just said talking about not making the rest of the building look haphazard, yeah. everything over there. But if we can sell through on on rink board advertising, I would do I would 100% support that to try to cut into that subsidy. Um, the other thing that I read, part of the uh, um, the proposal, was naming rights to the rinks. Um, the only thing that I have an issue with is the main rink seems to be the Teeter Kennedy rink. So if somebody came in with a sponsorship package for the main rink, are we going to keep Teeter Kennedy in the name? because I think he is so important to the history of hockey in Port Colburn that I would not want to see that removed in any way. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's going to be an issue around uh, sponsorship on that. Mr. So, to you, Mr. Mayor, uh, yeah, that was talked about um, back when we first started uh, this process and we were trying to get sponsorships for 
the Valley Center as a whole and then the different rinks and that. Um, and it was council's decision at the time that if we were to find somebody that would sponsor the rink one, that it would be whatever the sponsor is, Teeter Kennedy rink type of thing, that Teeter Kennedy would still be part of that naming process or with that, with that sponsor's name. Um, again, it would obviously we'd have to, um, depending on who the sponsor may come forward and say, I wanted, I wanted to sponsor rink one, and we'd have to discuss that with that uh, potential sponsor and then obviously bring it back to council also uh, for those types of things. Um, but definitely, I think that's, uh, again, a, a lost opportunity that we have and that we don't have a naming right for, for the two rinks. Because um, we said we can name the rinks, we can name the gymnasium, we can, um, there's a number of things that can be named in there. It's just we really haven't had, we, we went out the initial um, uh, package for sponsorship and all that, but we really didn't have a huge amount of feedback. And um, I'd say we'd, we'd have to get that back out there again at some point um, and see what type of response we do get if we, if whether it's you know local uh, businesses or somebody locally, a banks or whatever it may be, that um, somebody steps forward and says, hey, we're we're willing to uh, put our name on there. So hopefully we can get somebody and then we can negotiate that with them. Thank you, Mr. Sinas. Okay. Right. Just one quick other question, Peter. Um, You'd say, do we go outside and hire, hire a company to track this stuff down for us or we do it in-house? What's the normal commission rate for outside to come in and, uh, and sell for us? Twenty? Twenty percent? Okay, thanks. Okay, we are being live streamed this evening, so if someone from the uh, audience is going to make a comment, Perhaps they could come to the podium and push a little button and so we can have it recorded. Um, that's a, not an admonishment, it's a, something that I should have uh, brought to everyone's attention as we go forward as well. If you could direct your comments and questions through the chair, uh, that would make it uh, easier as well. Uh, Mr. Main, you're next, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you, Peter. I thought, you, I thought I had a new name for a minute there. <laughs> uh, I, I agree with Yvonne. Uh, I have no problem with uh, getting more money, uh, more advertising, but to have uh, uh, everything to be uniform so that you don't have a sign that's uh, 12 feet long and one that's six inches long, something that looks uh, appealing, and I think that's what I think council would like staff to do. Uh, Signs on boards have never affected my hockey game and uh, didn't make it any better either. But I think if we have any opportunity to make money uh, to offset, uh, I'm all for it 100 percent. But I would like to see the policy. I think that's our main concern here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Main. Are there any other questions? We have a recommendation moved and seconded to call for the vote. Oh, Mr. Sanets. Just for the clarification is um, uh, we definitely wanted to bring this forward to, to, to get council's uh, approval of, of going forward with it without doing an advertising policy first. So as long as we know that council, if, if council approves this tonight, then we would bring that back. And definitely we would be looking at um, bringing something that's um, aesthetically pleasing to, um, to, the, to the center itself. Um, with and, and possibly with with bringing back uh, you know uh, pictures of what it would look like on the boards where they may be situated um, on the uh, the walls may they be situated and then bring that all forward back to council in a future report and um, and then council they'll be able to decide yay or nay to certain things that may be within that and then we can move forward from there and try to generate as much revenue as we can. Thank you, Mr. Sanas. And Mr. Duset much mr. mayor through you to Peter uh, one of my questions would be when it will this happen and the reason for that is the, the 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 present season is finishing we should be ready hopefully before the next season which is September probably in the mid-september so hopefully we can get it done within there so we can get that started up if we're gonna do it let's do it so I, I don't want to see it in the middle of next winter let's put it that way Thank you. 
No further questions. Call for the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried unanimously. Item number two. Is there someone who wish to uh, recommend this item? Moved by Councillor Elliott, second by Councillor Bonner. Discussion? Councillor Elliott. Thank you, Mayor. Three to Peter. Um, we're talking about fees for everything across the board, right? Okay. One thing I noticed was talking about the arena. Um, we give a significant discount to minor hockey uh, in town, and we're charging uh, prime rate at about two hundred dollars an hour, give or take a couple of dollars, um, anywhere from five to ten p.m. at the arenas. But what I see is that we don't open the rinks until eight o'clock in the morning. So we. Am I correct in assuming that we don't have anybody that practices in early a.m. in town right now? Mr. Sass? Three, Mr. Mayor, I believe that we open at 6. That's, so we do have early and, morning practices? And, and I believe we do have some early morning practices uh, that do go on. I know in, in speaking, when it was under my department, I know in speaking with Brian, uh, before that uh, majority of the of the ice time is uh, is booked um, prime time especially um, trying to get more coming in early mornings um, in the uh, late evenings but uh, I'm, but we can double check on that uh, with with Ryan tomorrow and bring that back to council as okay. to how much our, our bookings are on that but it is six o'clock that we do open yeah and because I was just I was just wondering if we're running if we're warning practice time in the prime time time slots at five o'clock after five o'clock and we have others that are interested in booking times between five and ten that would be paying the adult prime time price and we're losing dollars by having practices between five and ten as opposed to renting for full value at the prime time price, do you know what I mean? Because I think there's there's a seventy or seventy five dollar difference per hour in price. So if if we're if we've got people that are looking to play between five and ten that pay the full price, and we've got practices going on, we're losing money by not pushing the practices to the early morning. And that's one thing that concerned me because when I played and I coached, practices were always six o'clock in the morning. Yeah. So Three, Mr. Mayor. I know there's a lot of variables that do go into it because um, there is a, a sort of a, a pecking order of when they looking at booking the the ice time for the beginning of the season. Um, I know minor hockey is up top of the list as to how much ice time they do get, and it all depends on you know if we have the AAA teams in and, and that type of thing, minor hockey uh, house leagues, and all those types of things. A lot of their ice time, I believe, is on Saturdays too. Um, and then in right after school um, where they come in and then I think more of the adult times is tends to be going later into the evening because depending on the kids age you're not going to have them you know playing at 10 11 o'clock at night so there's all of that that I think uh, our sports uh, coordinator tries to coordinate between uh, uh, the adult leagues the um, the whalers triple-a teams the house league teams and the and the rec leagues along with tournaments that do that do come in so all of that is, is is worked out um and juggled and uh so and try to um uh make sure that the majority of the ice time is, is booked and i know that in looking at the revenues that we've uh um the revenues have, have increased over the last few years because there are a lot more rentals that are that are taking place um and we have you know more tournaments that have that have come into and uh, um, and, and trying to do like sledge hockey uh, that type of stuff so there's a lot a lot more activity and it is raising our revenues okay just one quick thing Go mr. Mayor, through to Peter you kind of refer to a pecking order um, don't we reserve the right because it's our rinks to allocate ice time as we see fit when it comes into practices um, we're trying to maximize every every dollar of revenue we can out of it so shouldn't we have the first right to say if you're having a practice this is the ice times that we have available for practices 
I really want to maximize adult prime time, and if, and if we've got an overabundance of people looking for adult prime time ice that pay top dollar, um, that should come first to maximize, and practices that are at a discount price should be pushed into the mornings. Um, if you're talking $70, $75 an hour, and you can maximize more dollars by having more people pay play at adult time that pay that price, that could help us in the long run. I just if we could get just a quick report on that. Yeah, thanks. Any other questions on this recommendation? Yes, Mr. Bodner. Thank you, <coughs> Mr. Mayor. Through you to I guess Peter because this is financial. So these charges are for everything from going before a committee of adjustment to, you know, uh, putting in a culvert. It it's encompasses everything we do that we charge for. Is that correct? I agree, Mr. Mayor. Yes, it, it's a fully consolidated bylaw. So all of our fees have been incorporated into the, into this bylaw. And that was um, um, we talked about that last year. We brought it to council last year, the draft, and, and then we worked on it with uh, departments over the uh, over the year. And um, so yes, it encompasses all of the uh, all of the fees. So basically, when you're looking at fees, you can go to one bylaw and the schedules there, and you can look up whatever fees that, uh, and the public can look up whatever fees are, are available to us, and that would be uh, part of our bylaw, and you don't have to be searching in 10 different bylaws now. Sure. <clears throat> Just to follow up on that, you're talking about the schedule of fees that anybody can look it up. So I think it's, it's important for people to realize how we came up with those fees, where my understanding is, and I'm kind of sure I'm correct, that we can't charge more than what it costs us to do a service. Am I correct? We can't make money necessarily. Um, just another way to scoop money from somebody. Is that true that we're charging what it costs us to do whatever we're, we're doing at that time? It does <clears throat> If there, there were a number of, um, if you remember the um, last budget meeting, we, or last year's budget meeting, we talked about the user fees and, and so on. And majority of it is based on on cost cost recovery, um, but it's also based on on the amount of you know the amount of affordability. Uh, for example, ice time is is, is one example, sure. and um, ensuring that we're competitive. Um, if there's if, if there's other um, areas where they would provide a similar type service or whatever, like you know we have to be our marina. We want to be have our marina. You know, comparable to other marinas that are that are in the in the area, so those are the types of things that all come into consideration. It also comes into consideration um, uh, comparisons to uh, our neighboring municipalities um, as to you know where where user fees are because you want to be fairly consistent. If there's development happening in one municipality and we're charging a lot more in one, our municipality, um, where are they going to go? Uh, so there's a number of different variables that, that come into play when you know setting those, but the majority of it is is looking at what our actual costs are and, and, and recovering our costs. Sure. I'm so, not sure if Mr. Mayor, it's through you, else um, to say. do we? So how often do we look at that to make sure we're in the ballpark? Like we spent a lot of time, or you staff spent a lot of time coming up with those fees. So I'd imagine there was an initial look. I'm just thinking of things like we have a request in here from the. Um, the building inspector for a new computerized system that will supposedly cut down on time and you know and um, record things better. So if that actually saves time, is that ever a consideration? Does it, you know, as technology advances, do we ever look at something and say, you know? maybe we're charging a little too much on this, or is it just kind of set and then we just continue on raising it so much every time we have a budget? Through you, Mr. Mayor. The departments really should be looking at their fees uh, on an annual basis and then adjusting accordingly. And, and the nice thing about having a consolidated bylaw is now that you can easily know what the fees are and you can adjust the bylaw by pulling out one schedule and amending one schedule rather than a whole bylaw. 
Um, so each, each department, because so, I know that um, each department does look at them. It may not be, if it's not on an annual basis, it's definitely every couple of years that uh, departments would be looking at their fees. And as you know, we've always bring forward, you know, planning fees or building fees. They're, they're always coming forward periodically because things do change um, throughout the years. Okay. That. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you to Peter. Um, and maybe just something for all councillors. Uh, I remember last year, um, someone came to us and said that we were charging too much for things and and then, and then Peter had suggested to us that it was a fee that had been agreed upon on uh, at, at council level. Um, this is the bylaw that does that. So that when you have a citizen that comes and says, well, this is too expensive, I don't, I'm not, I don't want to pay that. Bottom line is, this is what it costs. And I remember us having some people up here I believe last last winter over over an issue of someone having to dig and, and and so on and they did it over the weekend and it cost them that much more because it was over the weekend again this bylaw is the one that has that so just be cognizant of the fact that if this is passed we've passed it and staff will follow our direction um, I, I, I I was a little bit um, perturbed is the only way I can put it last year when some people were questioning that charge and questioning the fact that staff had done what we had told them to do okay and that bothered me because if you're going to give direction to staff and staff does it then someone shows up and says well that's wrong you can't blame staff for what we have passed and if it needs to be changed then let's change it, but I don't believe staff need to hear the fact that they're wrong and we're right and that kind of stuff. And that's what happened that one time. It was uh, about a year ago, about a year ago. Some, some man came in and said, you know, there was a whole thing and it all had to do over the weekend. The charge, over the, the charge during, the, during the week at that time was about $50. Charge over the weekend was close to $500, okay? The cost for that is because it's over the weekend and you're bringing everybody in at double and double time and a half and that kind of stuff. So um, I, I just want everyone to be, be aware of the fact that if we pass this, that's what we're passing. So that if we pass this, then it's us, not staff. Staff are simply going to do what we tell them to do. Thank you, Mr. Doucette. Any further comments or questions? Mr. Maine. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, in all due respect, uh, Mr. Doucette is correct, but I think what we have to look at is our fees are a personal choice. They're not a taxpayer's choice. Taxes are, uh, you have no choice. Right, Peter? You, you pay the tax rate, you pay the tax rate. Whereas the fees uh, are a personal choice. You can either do it or you don't do it. So you have to accept what the cost is, the cost of doing business. And I think uh, that's, my point with the fees is uh, that makes it more fair, uh, or fairer, I should say. Uh, so when I read this over, I thought, okay, fine. All these fees, they're my personal choice. If I want to put up a bench, I want to rent a, an hour of uh, the arena time, that's still my personal choice. But the person who's paying the taxes don't, does not have a choice So, on the big scale. so. Thank you very much for this. This is a very interesting. Thank you, Mr. Appreciate Mayor. it. There being no further questions, I'd uh, call for the question. All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you. Now moving on to item number seven on the agenda. Mr. Sines, uh, you're going to provide us with an overview of the 2018 draft uh, budget. Now, Mr. Sness, do you wish to entertain questions during the presentation or after? Um, 
through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I, will, I, I don't mind uh, asking uh, or answering any questions uh, while we're going through the presentation. Uh, that, that would be fine. Okay. If the council could bring the, the request for a question to my attention, then we'll recognize you. Okay, Mr. Sines. So do the, uh, the applicants have to do Do the presentation from, uh, from the podium here. So uh, what I plan to do, Mr. Mayor, through you is um, go through uh, a number of uh, slides that uh, basically summarizes the, uh, the total budget package that, that you did receive. There's a lot of information in the budget package itself. So the presentation will, will summarize that. I provided that uh, presentation uh, to Council and um, so that you're able to uh, look at it and see if there's any questions that you may uh, have in the back of your mind and bring up this evening. So um, moving ahead, the reason now those two reports actually came forward is because obviously they, they affect the budget. Um, the advertising part of it um, won't affect the budget as much this year. If we can get some advertising going uh, by September, um, that would be additional revenue and then we'd be able to budget for it. In, in 2019, but at this point in time, we really don't have those numbers, and we we don't have anybody to that's advertising at this point. So, uh, as far as the fees uh, and, and charges go, um, I have in anticipation uh, of council passing uh, the uh, bylaw, we we did increase uh, um, the fees that were by a two percent uh, fees in, in in the marina and the uh, arena rates and so on. Um, in the budget, so that's already incorporated into into the budget itself. So, for uh, this evening, we're going to go over the uh, the details of the budget. And first thing is, we're going to go over uh, the different types of sources of revenue. And again, a lot of it, some of this is a repeat from last year, the year before, but it just refreshes, uh, I think, everybody's mind on uh, the types of revenue and the sources of revenue that we do have available to us as a municipality. We're going to look at um, their operating levy, the summary uh, version of the operating levy, what the staff is proposing. We will look at uh, the unfinanced requests uh, that staff have uh, brought forward for uh, council's consideration and uh, any funding that uh, that, uh, that goes along with uh, um, approving those. The blended tax summary, if you remember, um, each year we talk about uh, tax room and we talk about uh, the region and the school boards and uh, their uh, rates lowering and that opens up tax room that, uh, that the municipality actually is able to um, use in, in their increased uh, levies in order to still keep um, a low tax increase overall to the uh, rate pair. We're going to look at uh, what capital funds we do have available for capital projects and we'll look at the capital levy that we do have and the projects that uh, staff are, are proposing and how we're funding those. We will look at debt reserves. We started creating a debt reserve to pay for future debt and I'll go through that and uh, one of them is um, is the valet uh, center and how we're going to pay for that debt going forward. Provide council uh, with a current uh, debt or debenture limit update and then uh, a residential property tax comparison. So the first thing is sources of revenue. So the sources of revenue we have is the largest source of revenue is, is, our, t is our tax levy. It's about $16 million. Um, it includes operating and includes uh, our, our capital levy which is almost $2 million now. It includes user fees, which we just talked about, and that's uh, about roughly around $2 million that we do collect in user fees, and that subsidizes and lowers the, the tax levy uh, for, um, for the uh, residents. We also have a grant program. If you remember, uh, $775,000 that we put in reserve, and the interest on that, that uh, reserve uh, each year is used to uh, provide grants to different uh, community organizations and, we, and council has a committee that, uh, that reviews those. We have the Ontario Municipal Partnership Funds, which we get about $2.7 million. That's our largest uh, funding from uh, the, the province. We have uh, the Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund, that's the OCIF funding. And we received that, and that's been increasing on an annual basis. And I'll show you how that's um, increased uh, over the last couple of years and where it's going. 
Uh, new this year, um, it's a one-time, from what I understand, is this Ontario Main Street Revitalization Initiative, about $51,000 that we're receiving this year. And I'll um, mention the council as to how um, staff is recommending those funds to be spent. We also, are for large capital projects, as you know, we, we debenture for those, and we have in the last uh, couple years, uh, was able to debenture a number of projects and, and get a number of the uh, main capital uh, issues off the uh, books of uh, council. We receive federal gas tax revenues, and we have reserves and reserve funds. Additional sources of revenue, obviously, if there, we have new assessment growth, we have seen some assessment growth in, uh, in the city with some uh, the new building that's going on, but still it's around that under 2%, so it's, it's not dramatic, but it is something and it does help um, lower our tax rate, um, which you'll see um, when we go through the presentation. We can increase user fees, which we, we, uh, we, we are now. We were looking at re um, increasing them by about 2%. We can uh, also add capital charge on user fees, and we do have some capital charges on, uh, for example, at Roselawn, where we, uh, we collect fees, and that goes into a capital reserve for Roselawn, um, also for uh, the marina. Uh, so there's a few, few areas that we do uh, get into that type of uh, fee structure. As you know, we have the net proceeds still sitting in reserve from the NRBN sale, and that's uh, where Council's direction is we're, we're going to hold on to that and hopefully leverage that with some additional funding from other levels of government. Um, we have 6.1 million, I believe. Area surcharges, this is something we talked about last year and I uh, apologize to Council that we haven't really moved forward on the storm sewer project. Um, we have, staff have been working and on developing some new options for the rate structure. And what uh, staff are going to do is bring forward a report back to council with the, uh, we have about two or three different options and how that would uh, affect uh, going forward. And what we were looking at is bringing that report to council and then have a public meeting and have that for um, an implementation in, in 2019. We uh, do have the storm sewer and the Nickel Area storm sewer that we're starting to pay debenture on and uh, we're, we're able to pay the debenture for this year. Um, uh, out of our debt reserve, but um, come 2019 is when uh, the majority of that uh, debt would come forward and we would then look at uh, using the storm sewer area charge to finance that debenture and future storm sewers in the, in the future. So we're bringing that forward back to council. Uh, we have an increase in capital, uh, in our capital uh, Levy, tax levy, uh, one and a quarter percent. We have, you, as you know, over the last number of years, council has been adding about one percent, which is about a hundred thousand, hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. Um, and I'm recommending that we actually move it up one to one and a quarter percent because we still have to close that gap, and that brings up to about two hundred thousand dollars. And we've included that in the budget. Talked about the tax room, region education uh, rates. And uh, we're able to take advantage of that uh, again this year. And we have matured debentures for capital projects. And I'll show you how some of the matured debentures and how we're looking at using those. Mr. Mayor, I have a question. Any questions from members of council? Yes, Mrs. Butters. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Peter. Um, and c to do with the tax room for the region and education, I just have a question. Are we becoming too dependent on that um, On that using that tax room and because there's going to come a day where there isn't going to be uh -huh. that tax room so kind of what are we makes me a little bit nervous to keep on doing it and I just wonder if there's like a plan going forward to either wean off of that mm -hmm. or I don't know I just want your thoughts on it sure. I guess three Mr. Mayor the tax room is 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 something that's um, available just on an annual basis, and, and it's not always, um, like last year, it was, it was a, a less amount there. What it does provide uh, council is to be able to do um, more things and increase our levy without increasing the, um, the bottom line, increasing taxes to the ratepayer or to our residents. So for example, we can increase our, our levy 
by five or six percent, but the because there's that tax room, um, what it does is the the bottom line the, or the blended tax rate with all three agencies is maybe two percent, two and a half percent. So next year, our le we may not uh, require our levy to be increased five or six percent. We may only need a levy increase of two percent. And if the tax room is is shrunk, then we, 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 would, we would have to adjust our, um, our asks and to make sure that our blended tax rate is still around that two, two and a half percent or whatever the affordability is that the uh, council believes that the residents can, can, can handle. So in the years that there is a large um, uh, tax room available to, to us, and um, this was something that I brought forward, or I was asked actually by the ministry last year as to how we were financing our operation center. And um, my answer to them was we're, we're raising, we're increasing our levy in order to pay for it, but because there is that reduction from the education in the region, we're able to do it with minimal impact on the, on the taxpayer in the end. And they said, that's a great idea. That's, that's, that, that's, that's what we want. That, that's what we want to hear. So it was a positive. Um, it was a positive from the ministry, and it's a positive for us if we are able to take advantage of that. Now, obviously, if we don't need to increase our levy by 5 or 6%, we only need to increase it by 2%, then that just means it's um, a lower overall tax increase to, uh, to, the, to, the, um, to the residents. But the fact is, is that with that being available, and there's things that we are, that we need to do, um, levels of service increases, uh, staffing increases, things that we need to do as a municipality in order to provide the levels of service, if we can do that by using that tax room and keeping the tax, the overall taxes to a minimum, then we're benefiting going forward into the future because we don't need to, we won't be having to double up on that because we already have it in our levy. Any other questions? Mr. Elliott. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through to Peter. Just getting back to the, um, the increase in capital tax levy, which is the asset management fund. Um, how, many, <laughs> how many more years is that gonna continue to increase until we get to the funding level that the province wants us to be at? I do have a slide on that, okay. and basically we're looking at about uh, seven years that we would get to the point where we are matching our depreciation or our amortization, um, which is the level we want to be at plus, uh, because obviously replacement cost is a lot higher than historical depreciation. So, uh, but to meet that at a $200,000 annual amount, um, we're, we're about seven or eight years out, uh, which isn't bad. Um, I know a lot of municipalities have been 20 years out. Um, you know, some municipalities are getting there quicker than others, um, but I think we've taken an approach where we're able, we're increasing it. We started out at 100,000, we've gone to 150,000, and this year I'm recommending we go to 200,000 and keep that going forward. So we're slowly increasing that, and uh, we're, we're slowly getting there. And what I'm finding is is that the the um, the more important projects or capital projects that we require in infrastructure to do, we're starting to, at the point to be able to do that with the amount of funding that we do have, although we know that there's more that could be done, but at least we're able to, to, to start moving forward and we're starting to put some uh, of the dollars into a capital reserve so that we'll be able to have a reserve in the future that we'll be able to um, determine how much infrastructure we need to do on an annual basis and actually then have the money in, 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 the, in our funds in order to do those projects as they come forward um, based on not the historical value of the property or the infrastructure, but on the condition of the infrastructure. Perfect. Just so people know that we're collecting this money because it's provincially driven. They've mandated that municipalities develop a reserve fund to replace infrastructure, not to rely solely on the province giving money to municipalities that don't set money aside. So this is a proactive approach on the municipal side, and it's kind of relieving the province of the financial burden of us going to them and saying, you know, hey, our water lines and our sewers are broke. We need to fix them, and we don't have any money. So they're, they've mandated that we set up the reserve funds. So that's, 
people understand that this is money going towards future repairs in the municipality. If you want to comment on that. Uh, yeah, uh, through Mr. Mayor, that, that's, that's correct. Um, and it's twofold. It's uh, part of our asset management plan going forward, and I'm going to go through a few slides um, after this to just talk about the asset management and uh, the fact that we're, we're actually requiring uh, to have a capital asset supervisor to do the amount of work that needs to get done over the next five to six years in order to have a fully encompassed asset management plan that's fully budgeted, that's funded, um, and, and, and being able to then uh, take that and use it as a budget tool for council and for staff knowing exactly what infrastructure needs to be replaced on an annual basis. Thank you. Mr. Louie, you have a comment? I think through your worship to Councilor Elliott, there's, a, there's a, even a bit more to it than that. I'll take it a bit further. <clears throat> maybe, an, maybe it's an oversimplification, but the amount of assets we lose in a year due to aging and depreciation exceeds the amount of work we do in terms of paving roads and building buildings. There's an infrastructure deficit. It's every year. At the end of a four-year term of council, the city's actually in a worse position than at the start of the term of council. This is the money that's going to bridge that gap. Putting this $200,000 into that reserve and increasing it each year is what is closing that gap and shrinking the amount of the infrastructure deficit. And that's what the province is requiring us or, or I guess encouraging us to do is to make sure that we close that infrastructure deficit. Any further questions, Mr. Bond? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Peter. Peter, just because Councilor Elliott used sewer and water as an example, <laughs> is this actually, can sewer and water tap into this? Through you, Mr. Mayor. No, this, the sewer right. and water budget okay. will come yeah. next month. Yeah. And uh, that is totally separate. And uh, I will show Council at that time where our infrastructure deficit lies both with water and sewer. This is, this is strictly with uh, the rest of our infrastructure, buildings, um, storm sewers, because they're not, they're not funded, yeah. and um, you know, equipment, all the other types of assets that we do have, sure. which is, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll actually have a slide on that that we'll, uh, I'll, I'll show council. Sure. I just want to make sure all those people that yes. fall off water the chair and totally Ward separate. 4 wasn't paying for Dave Elliott's sewer and water. No. So thank you very much. <laughs> Any further questions? There being none, uh, Mr. Ness, and okay. we continue. And moving forward, uh, I mentioned the Ontario Municipal Partnership Fund. So in 2017, we received $2.8 million. We're actually receiving a little bit less this year. We're receiving $2,786,000, so about $19,000 less. Um, how we're applying that funding is, if, if you remember, our, um, we've been consistently putting uh, $2,345,000 towards the operating levy. That reduces the, the, the tax levy. And that was our base for the last probably six, seven years. Mm -hmm. Anything that we've been receiving over and above that from uh, the ONPF funds, we've been putting towards one time or capital projects. And the reason for that is we never know when that fund is going to start to diminish. And so the additional funds that we do get on an annual basis um, have been um, used quite um, satisfactory by council in order to do other types of things and other projects um, with, without having to uh, uh, be put on the on the tax levy. So that's and I'll show you where we're going to where we're going to spend that four hundred forty thousand dollars. The other um, item that uh, is in the operating uh, in, in the budget is if you remember for the operation center we were funding the debenture levy over the debenture over about three or four years. So in 2016, we levied $365,000 of the $739,000 that we required. 2017, we, add, we increased the levy by $130,000. That left $244,000. So we have two options. We can fund the whole thing this year. But last year, again, council said, let's fund it over a couple years. So uh, what I have in the budget is actually uh, $130,000 for 2018, and then 
Next year, we would levy the $114,000 and it would be then fully funded um, in 2019. The $114,000 that we have to pay this year, um, I'll show you uh, a little later that it will be coming out of our debenture reserve in order to, to tie us over until 2019 when we can levy for the, uh, the balance of that. Any questions on that? Okay, I'll play. continue. All right, so overall, our base budget came in at 2.84%. That's the, the base budget on our overall operations. Last year, we were at 2.69%, so we're just a little bit above uh, last year's base uh, increase. We have uh, lost revenues of about 0.43%. Last year, it was 0.2%. So our overall levy base increase is 3.27%. So that's our starting point. Um, and in 2017, our base levy increase was 2.89%. Uh, and I made a note 2016 was 3.32%. So this year, we're sort of in between the two years. Um, this levy doesn't, um, the above levy doesn't, um, levy increases uh, are prior to any additions for the capital levy and the debentures or any requests, um, or the other staff requests. So the next slide will show you that we've, we're starting at 3.27% being our levy increase. Our capital budget increase, which is the $200,000, is one and a quarter percent. Last year was 1%. And the debenture, the $130,000, is 0.8%, uh, which was similar to last year. So our overall proposed uh, levy increase, and this is strictly the levy increase, it's not the tax increase. So this is just the levy increase, is 5.33%. And last year we were at 4.72% at this point. This doesn't include the additional staff request, which is about $200,000, and I'll show you the list of that in a minute, which is about one and a quarter percent increase to our levy. So again, I want to emphasize that the 5.33% is just strictly our levy increase, but it's not necessarily a tax increase. So based on that, I mentioned that we have uh, unfinanced uh, requests and funding. So we have about $1.7 million in requests. They're being funded by a number of different areas, um, being re uh, recommended by council or recommended by staff. The OMPF fundings, I told you we had $440,000. That's going towards that $1.7 million. The reserve funds of $464,000. Other grants, $211,000. We've deferred $100,000 worth of uh, work. Uh, the annual capital levy of the 200000 the operation center debt of 130000 and we have potentially $200,000 that could affect the levy um, by staff increases or staff for a request. So majority of that $1.7 million um, is, is funded um, within the budget um, and inc included, including the capital levy and the operations uh, debt. So the $201,000, which is being requested by staff, is a number of things. Uh, East-West Trail Maintenance, uh, Council wanted a little bit more work to be done on the East-West Trail, uh, tree trimming, brushes, brushing back and so on. So about $50,000 uh, in uh, a levy increase. So if we're gonna continue on the trails, we'd have to add that to the levy. So $50,000. Staff requested $100,000, um, and if you see in your working papers that we'll go through tomorrow, 50000 of that we're, we're uh, funding from the OMPF funding, and 50000 go on the levy. So we're sort of easing our way into getting uh, a proper level of service and proper level of funding into the, into the levy. Tree trimming and removal, an additional $20,000. Staff is requesting for uh, the removal of, of trees and uh, the ash borer and th that type of thing. The big one is in staffing. Uh, there's a number of staffing re requests, part-time staffing, about $85,000, and we'll go through those individually uh, tomorrow night. Staff development, $6,000. Winter operations, $14,000. Physician recruitment, $10,000, and other operational uh, items, about $16,000. Skipped over the Canal Days Festival um, because they have a question mark there right now with uh, what's going to be proposed um, of the, um, 
the changes to Canal Days, uh, which is a report to be coming to Council. We're not sure uh, roughly how much that may add to the cost of, uh, of uh, putting on Canal Days. There's going to be an, potentially additional costs in policing, security, and so on. Uh, so that'll be coming forward, and uh, I have an estimated cost, but I don't want to, I'll let Council know that uh, later date. Um, so with that, and we get go through it tomorrow, Council will go through each of those items and say yes or no to any of those items, but potentially if Council approved all those items, that's about $200,000, and that would increase our, our levy um, increase from 5.33 to 6.58%. You have a question from Mr. Doucette. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Through you to uh, Peter. Uh, Where did you get the $10,000 from phys physician recruitment? That is, through you, Mr. Mayor, that is um, a request that, actually it's not a request, it's what I brought forward to the Physician Recruitment Committee. We have um, so much in reserve right now and for physician recruitment and we have a contract with the current physician over a three-year period if you remember um, and the reserve will be about ten thousand dollars short next year so that will cover the shortage for the physician uh, that we currently have on contract um, and then you'll see further into the uh, budget presentation uh, the, the physician recruitment committee is requesting uh, $35,000 okay. annually to be put into reserve for any new doctors that may come on board. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Um, I was just wondering where the $35,000 was because $10,000 is definitely not enough. Yeah. That's and I was wondering about the other thirty five. Sure. Okay. Yep. Thank you. So with all that said, this is just a, su this is a summary of, of where we're at. So I mentioned that our base levy increase was 3.27 percent which is about um, and, and when you look across the uh, the table on the screen there the average residential tax increase now this is the actual tax increase um, on the blended so the region the school and um, and the city is 0 0.78 percent or 24 dollars to the average residential <coughs> homeowner that's based on our on our um, our base budget of 3.27 percent we add in the capital levy of 200000 We add in the debt of $130,000. That brings our levy increase to 5.33%, which is a 1.78% increase, blended tax increase to the res average residential uh, rate pair, or $54. I'll come to the right-hand side in a minute. If Council chose to approve that $200,000 of all the staff requests, and the tax levy increase went to 6.58%, the overall blended tax increase would be 2.39% or $72. So this is where, Councillor Butters, where we're saying we can have a, almost a 7%, 6.5% levy increase, but that with the blended rate, with the uh, reduced education tax rate and the regional tax rate at this point, the actual effect on a residential, average residential rate pair is 2.39%. And that's the key um, that anybody looking at their, their property taxes in the bottom line, it would be $72 annual, annual increase. It can be anywhere in between that depending on what council approves um, going forward into the, into the budget. Just as a comparison, in 2017 our levy increase was 4.72%, which was um, equated to 2.99% overall tax increase, or $87. And in 2016, we actually had a, a 7% levy increase, and our tax uh, blended tax increase was only 1.79%, and that's because it was more of that tax room available. So it changes from year to year. The right-hand side, there is um, a potential. The region is, um, right now, the region is responsible for tax policy. So they're responsible for the tax ratios that uh, are implemented for every municipality in the Niagara region. So for example, uh, um, the uh, multi-res pays at two times the residential rate. Um, commercial is 1.75%. They're looking at the tax ratios right now and they're looking at potentially shifting a couple of them, potentially multi-res, 
could be maybe a small change in commercial or industrial. So until the region passes their tax ratios, it could still have an effect on, on, on our um, taxes. So what I did was, based on a potential change to two tax ratios, if you look at our 5.33% um, levy increase, where it's a 1.78% blended tax increase, if the region changed some of the tax ratios, it could potentially raise the increase of uh, the taxes uh, to 2.03%, or from $54 to $61, so $7 increase. Again, if council approves everything that, that, uh, that staff are requesting, with a, a 2.39% blended tax increase, that may raise up to 2.64% or $80 or an additional $8, depending on what tax ratios that the region uh, approves and we have to then abide by those and, and implement them. So there's a little bit of, uh, little bit of play there in uh, where there could be a slight increase to the residential uh, taxpayers based on what the region sets their tax ratios at. Any questions? Any questions on that? Or council? Mr. Elliott? <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Uh, through you to Peter. Just to go back a couple of slides. Um, on our operating, the base, the base tax levy increase of 3.27%. How much of the increase is out of our control based on salary increases, step increases, um, things that are mandated to happen? that we don't have control over to start with. Because there, there is a portion of an increase every year that is going to happen whether you want it to or not. Um, and then this year also with the, uh, with the increase in Bill 148, mm. right? There's going to be uh, salary increases for uh, some of our employees too that, that are going to affect us that, that are out of our control. Three, Mr. Yeah. Mayor. Um, on page one of your package, there's a operating levy summary which breaks down a little bit more of the operations. So salaries and wages and benefits is about 3.3%, which is basically out of our control. Utilities, about 0.2%. So there's, you're at about 3.5% right there. Um, that's essentially out, out of out of our control as to what happens. Um, we 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 have compensated some of that with some new revenues of about uh, two percent. So um, so you know both with higher expenditures, we're trying to compensate some with some additional revenues coming in. Um, but essentially, that's that's where our majority of our increase um, lies for the overall budget. Okay. Just, just to quickly follow on the, up on that, just because as we're going through this very quickly, in in the summary that we're doing right now, it doesn't allude to that. It's, it shows it shows some increases and in, and in things and in, in projections and whatnot, but it doesn't show what we're faced with from the get go, right? Here's an here's an increase that yep. that's non debatable that's going to happen anyways, and then we're everything on top of that. So just so that people know. That here's the starting point, and then we're going from there. So Correct. there is there is kind of like the floor, and then we'll see how high the ceiling gets. So Correct. Go ahead, Mrs. Sinesk. All right. The um, so the next few slides um, are in yours, and, and actually I printed them off so that you're able to see 2017 and 2018 together. Um, can't see them on the on the screen together, but. When you look at 2017 revenues as a percentage budget, they're pretty much dead on the same, 2017 and 2018. So our revenues, really the percentage split hasn't really changed much. Majority of our, our revenues is uh, through uh, the tax levy, which is about 70% of our revenues uh, in order to cover our, our operating budget. 10% uh, comes from fees and charges, 10% from the uh, provincial funding, and then we have some smaller amounts through other revenues. On uh, the dollar side, I mentioned we, we bring in about $16 million of uh, tax levy revenue and uh, about $2.3 million in fees and $2.3 million in provincial funding. And then we have a number of, uh, 
uh, other revenue is almost a million dollars and uh, so on. So as they diminish down, that's 2017. 2018 is very similar. 16 and a half million is our levy, and 2.4 million for fees and charges and in, in, uh, provincial funding. So that just shows you sort of the split between as to where we're collecting our revenues to to fund our operating. On the expenditure side, um, I've split this out based on the departments. Um, there's been a real change because of our reorganization, um, community services with economic development and parks and uh, recreation there. Uh, a lot of the, the, the uh, valet center, parks, and, um, and economic development have moved from either planning or engineering over into community services and economic development. So you can see that um, the majority of the expenditures are in community and economic development, almost $6 million and $4.5 million in, in engineering and operations. Um, the valet center, you could look at, it's both part operations and community services. So you, you, there could be a split there, but I haven't done that. Um, but that just gives you an idea of, of where the, um, uh, where the uh, costs are expended. In, uh, that's, that was 2017, and then the comparison is 2018, which is roughly similar, similar costs. And we look at the percentage distribution, 2017 and 2018 is, again, fairly similar. 28% uh, is community and economic development. 21% engineering is the majority of the costs, and um, administration is about 19%. And you'll see, I guess the one thing is uh, the bigger change was in the uh, debentures. You'll see in 2017, 6% uh, was our, um, our costs for uh, our, our debt, and uh, 2018, it's 9% it's nine, nine now. And that's, again, because of the, uh, in the last two years, we've We've uh, debentured a number of, of, of projects. The, um, those projects were the operations center, the um, east, uh, east side la uh, employment lands uh, design, the storms, uh, nickel area storm sewer, and the marina lift and some water, wa uh, water meters is, in, is, in the, is not in this slide, but it will be in the water. Uh, so that's that's where the increase of the nine percent is, and again that then diminishes each year as we start paying down our, our debt. Any questions? Any questions on the slides? Okay, so moving into capital, so we have a number of areas where capital funds are available to us. We have six hundred twenty-two thousand uh, dollars that we apply to roads. We have fifty thousand dollars that uh, staff are. Um, uh, recommending we set aside for facility LED lights. We're doing a lot of changes in uh, all the facilities going to LED, which is saving us in hydro uh, costs over a period of time. Uh, so we've, we've got a little bit of uh, money set aside to do that. And I know that we're, we're, we're also doing a, a program where we're um, uh, purchasing LED lighting, putting them in our facilities, and we're getting um, the grants back to almost cover the, almost 100% of the cost. So that's the initiatives that uh, I know Jim's department's uh, working on. The Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund, uh, we have uh, this year it's, it's increased to two, almost $260,000, uh, which is good. Next year it goes up to $400,000. So it's, it's been increasing over the last few years. The new uh, fund, this Ontario Main Street Revitalization Fund of $51,000. We have our capital levy from last year of 1.7 million, and we have our capital levy increase this year of 200,000. So we're up to 1.9 million dollars. So we're slowly getting there. Development charges we have uh, in our reserves about 179,000 dollars. As you know, we're not really collecting development charges, so we don't have a lot of money there. We do have matured debentures of 261,000 dollars, which we've reallocated to pay for other debentures. Um, 210,000 is going towards paying down the Main Street CIP, which we have a, a couple years left on that. Um, Thirty-one thousand dollars is going to pay paying for the marina lift, which and these are all without um, having any effect on the tax levy. Um, and we have about thirteen thousand dollars that's uh, going towards some uh, marina unfunded uh, capital, 
and we have about six thousand dollars that was uh, when uh, uh, we reinvested uh, the fire vehicle uh, last year. So that's the two hundred sixty-one thousand. I'll show you how we're spending that later. We have about nine hundred thirty-one thousand uh, dollars that we're bringing in, in, that we have in reserves there, and we have the net proceeds of six point one million dollars from the NRBN sale that we're waiting on government funding for. And obviously, we have future mature debentures and potentially provincial and federal grants whenever they come, come, come our way. So that's what we have available to us. The provincial grants, I mentioned the 260000 and the 51000 So what staff uh, in this budget are uh, request or recommending is that $129,755 is being added to the roads uh, budget. $80,000 of the OCIF funding um, that we would, if council approves it, that we would hire on contract a capital asset budget supervisor. And this is what I mentioned before about the asset management plan. That we, uh, we right now we have a, 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 a um, capital asset coordinator that um, does all the technical work um, for our uh, capital assets uh, on an annual basis. Um, what this person would, would do is um, essentially take full control of the asset management plan itself and work with our consultants that we've been working with in developing our asset management plan. If you remember, in 2012, we passed our asset management plan. We're updating it now. Um, and I'll show you uh, in a little while in, in another slide where we have to go with the province. And in order to do that, we need somebody to actually take the bull by the horns and, and, and run with this thing because you have to deal with levels of service, costs cost of levels of service, and um, how it's going to be budgeted, how it's going to be funded, creating a whole capital program for the future of, uh, for all of our assets, not just the core assets, which is your water, sewer, uh, roads, and bridges, but your facilities, your equipment, uh, any type of asset that we have. So it's, a, it's an ongoing project that the province is, 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 and the federal government now is pushing for. And in order to get grants, they're saying you have to have all this uh, in place also. So they've, it was supposed to be a plan that was being over four years. They've now extended it because they, the municipalities have uh, lobbied and said, listen, we don't have enough time to do all this, and we don't have the resources to do this, and they've extended it out over six years now. So it's, that's, that's where we're, we're sitting. So that is being recommended that that be funded out of this um, Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund because uh, they say that you can use those funds for your asset management uh, planning. Also, uh, works, orders, and equipment maintenance software. This is another um, continuation of uh, our financial system, but it more relates to operations in um, providing for uh, uh, complete work orders, maintenance schedules for all their equipment, and it all ties back into our financial system. Um, and it also ties into the um, capital asset program that this person would be doing and working on to ensure that all of our equipment is being up to date and, uh, and replaced accordingly. So that's about $50,000. Uh, the, that would, that basically um, uh, takes care of the $260,000 funding of the, that we have. The $51,000, we're proposing that the pedestrian crosswalk over on Clarence Street, um, the Ontario Main Street Revitalization Fund is, is it came at a perfect time because that's exactly what it's for. Um, in the documentation that they sent us, uh, they actually stated in there it's for pedestrian crosswalks along with other types of incentives for the downtown communities. So that $45,000 is a perfect fit for that uh, program. Also, the other $6,000 um, that we would, um, there's uh, some uh, traffic signal um, uh, on Welland Street, I think it is, or a cabinet, whatever. The, um, Jim, I'm not sure what the, the traffic signal for the $6,000 that we were going to put it towards. Three, Mr. Mayor to Peter, that was for that Clarence and Welland um, traffic signal controller, I believe, right? Controller. And then the balance, five hundred forty-nine dollars, as a yeah, cookie jar. Any questions of Mr. Sinet? So that's got a question, Mr. Dash. 
and the reason I asked you that question today on the software system is because of some of the other things I read into here, like another 50 grand over and above what we've paid for this POS system. This is a regional, or this is a system designed for communities to run with. Why do we got to keep upgrading in all these little areas? It should have not have been something that was complete where you could just pick on different parts of it and use it to your advantage. Like, I don't know. I mean, we're buying more and more software here. Mm -hmm. That we spent how much on this system? Three, Mr. Mayor, the financial system is, uh, yes, we, we purchased the financial system, which is strictly on the finance side of things for um, assets and or for the um, tax billings, our accounting system, all that software. We did get pricing on, at the time, we did get pricing on a uh, work order system, and uh, but it was too expensive. And actually the one that we have, uh, we're looking at now, is a um, uh, software provider that we already use and ties in with our capital asset program and ties into our financial system program so and it's and it's a cheaper co less lesser cost so it was it was a better fit to wait and see what else was out there and able to bring this one in at this time any follow-up mr dench Mr. Main. Mr. Mayor, through you to Peter. Just a clarification, Peter. This capital asset budget supervisor, how will that tie in or relate to uh, uh, our grant proposal guy if we ever come down with a grant proposal person? Do they work hand in hand or is it two separate entities here? Through you, Mr. Mayor, you're talking about somebody that would actually write our grants. Okay. For, for grants, uh, I believe that's what you're, you're getting at. Um, there's no reason why um, this person couldn't do some grant writing. Um, it all depends also on, on the type of grant. Um, you know, if you have you know, specific expertise in, in certain types of grants that may be out there and uh, being able to work with them. But like I've written grants, a uh, number of staff have written, um, written uh, grant proposals. Um, the whole idea is that, yes, if, it's, if it is uh, a capital projects and this person is in charge of our capital assets and our projects and the infrastructure and working with engineering and the different departments as to conditions of their assessments and putting them all in line for what years they should be replaced and so on. And if grant proposals came up that were capital related, then there's probably no reason why this person couldn't be doing that. We'd probably need some training um, in order to make sure that you know individuals that are writing the grants uh, have some training in, in writing them so that they write them properly so that we will get the funds or have a good shot at getting the funds and, um, and move from there. Thank you very much, yeah. Peter. Go ahead, Mr. Sinesa. So this is, uh, I think, where some of the councillors were, were going to with, with, with regard to where we are with our infrastructure deficit. So right now our total depreciation as of 2016 was $4.1 million. And our capital levy with uh, the $200,000 in this year is $1.9 million. The library levy is $35,000. The OCIF funding we have uh, included $130,000. And federal gas tax is $622,000. So that's our capital majority of our capital funding, which is about uh, $2.7 million. So in 2018, our shortfall is about 1.5 million or 35%. Last year, we were at 1.7 million, which is 41%. So you can see we're, we're slowly getting there. Um, and $200,000 a year over the next seven years will get us to the $1.4 million. Uh, doesn't mean that that number does change every year. Not drastically, but um, um, but that that will slowly get us or get us to the point where we can then fund our depreciation, which will give us that uh, four million dollars uh, to be able to allocate to any infrastructure on an annual basis that needs to be done. Question, Mr. Bodner. Peter, just before you leave that, so that's. That's in a dedicated reserve strictly for 
replacing assets and everything. Like a, a future council couldn't hijack some of that and offset the tax levy with it. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Some of it is, is being put away into reserve. Right. But we do spend about $1.7 million annually right now. Yeah. Um, it doesn't mean that we're spending enough money. We should be spending probably $4 million worth of work, but we can't afford it at this point in time. So we are spending about 1.7, maybe, th you know, uh, of, of our capital levy, plus we put more into roads and so on. So a lot of this we are spending on an annual basis, so it's not actually going into reserve. There's some going into reserves, uh, whatever we don't spend on an annual basis. But the whole idea is to, at, at some point, reach the point where we actually will be able to put $4 million in that reserve, and then that $4 million you spend the next year, and so on and so on based on a, a, an overall capital budget for the next 10, 20 years that lays out every asset that we have and what year that should be replaced. Mr. Elliott. Thank you, Mayor. Through you to, to Peter. What does the addition of the Valet Center and the new Operations Center do to this? When does it factor into replacement, or does that take this into account right now? The through you, Mr. Mayor, the depreciation of the new, um, not the operation center yet, but the valley center is included in there. So uh, the valley center was built in 2017, so that'll, we'll see that next year. And, the, and then the depreciation on the new facility. So which means, that's, that's what I mean, this number will continue to change based on, and the thing is, the newer our facilities, the higher the depreciation, but that also means that that's the amount of money you should be putting away because it's going to have to be replaced in 30, 40 years. Go ahead, Mr. Zanath. So with regard to capital levy projects, right now um, there's approximately $5 million that um, is in your binder that we'll go over tomorrow of capital projects. How they're being funded is through our capital levy of $1.9 million. Reserve funds of 931,000, the federal gas tax of 622, the OCIF grant, the Main Street grant, some other minor grants that we have, $50,000. Um, the public transit grant program, we're still working on that. Um, we, we completed two of uh, seven projects last year on the trails for the public transit grant. Deferred funding, 1.3 million. Um, what that actually is, is the Majority of it is the $1.3 million, which was from the uh, fire uh, department's report on their future expenditures over the next number of years. Uh, so I put it on deferred right now, but that's a discussion that council is going to have to have when we get into it tomorrow as to is it something that we need then to plan out over the next five to ten years as to how much of that needs to be done on an annual basis. And then we're putting about $174,000 into that capital reserve. Any, Any questions, questions on that? There being none. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Sonnes. This next, um, the next couple, few slides is, and it was in your packages, um, and it talked about um, what debt, our debt reserves, what we have, and how we can um, use those debt reserves. This is, and this is um, funds that we've levied for and we put into reserve for future debt. Majority of it is from the operations center, because if you remember, we started levying earlier than when we had to pay for the debenture. We started with 365,000 in 2016. That's part of that $740,000. So because we were actually levying early, it was a, a benefit to us because we were able to do it over three or four years, but we were actually levying prior to us having to pay the money out for debentures. So we were able to create this debt reserve. So we have about seven, at the end of 2017, we have about $741,000 in this debt reserve. Part of that we have to pay for the, the debt for 2018. I'll show you that in a minute. The street lights, we have $114,000, and that was when we went to the LED street lights and we had some grants and we had some savings, and basically we were uh, paying for the debenture from the savings that we had in our hydro costs, which was, which was an excellent thing. 
we had some dollars left over that we set aside in, into this reserve. So we have $114,000 sitting there. We could use that in the, in the future and in the last year of that debenture and, and be able to pay the debenture off with that. But what I'm proposing to council is that we take all of these funds and we consolidate them and, and then we spend them out accordingly based on a, a schedule that I have that I'll show you in a minute. We have 96,000 in a general debt reserve, and that was, um, if you remember, uh, we, we were, we're now setting aside $38,000 every year to go into a debenture reserve. And the marina uh, debenture, uh, debentures that matured are also going into there, so that's the $96,000. The Valet Center has uh, about $5,500 left in, uh, in, in that, that reserve to pay for the, the, uh, the valet debenture. So this is where uh, the concern lies in that the fact that we didn't raise enough sponsorship money in order to pay for the debenture over the whole 10 year period. So 2018 is the year where basically we're running out of funds from our sponsorships money to uh, pay for the debenture fully. Our dimension is about $340,000 and we're getting $125,000 um, on an annual basis. So I'll show you in a minute how I propose for council, recommend to council that we handle it. We also had $35,000 that was raised for the uh, skate park um, from uh, sponsorships. So we have about $992,000 sitting in those reserves that we could consolidate as a debt reserve. So. There was about three pages in your binder that showed how we pay for all this. So I tried to summarize it in this one page. So our balance at the beginning of 2018, as you can see, is $992,000. We will receive this year $241,000 in new funding. And what that is is um, our sponsorship dollars um, for the Valet Center, which is about $153,000 for 2018. We have our general levy going in at 38,000 and we have some mature debt that's going into that account for $50,000. That makes up the 241,000. So if you take the 992,000, the 241,000, if you remember we have to pay the uh, balance of the operating um, centers to venture, the 114,000, because we're only levying 130,000 this year of the 244. So that's the balance of that because we have to pay that this year. So we're gonna pay for it out of this fund the storm sewer, the Nickel Area storm sewer, we debentured in 2017, or no, we actually just debentured it. We got the money uh, in February. There's uh, one payment that's going to be due in 2018, and that's $171,000. I mentioned before that we don't have the program in place yet for the storm sewer, so we can fund this, this year's debenture out of this debt reserve, which is $171,000. We will also, on an annual basis, um, also pay for the debenture for the east side employment lands. And that $30,000 is an annual amount and that will be paid for through this debt reserve. Also, the marina, $51,000, we have some uh, debt that would pay, be paid out of this reserve. And the last is 343000 that uh, is the valet debenture. In 2018, with all of that paid, we start 2019 at $522,000. We receive $226,000 in uh, funding, and that again is uh, through sponsorships and in, in the, the, the debent mature debentures that we're putting into this account. In 2019, we only have two debenture, three debentures that we actually have to pay, and that is the employment lands, the marina of 40,000, and the valley center. So in 2020, we start with 333,000. So we're able to, to, to continue to pay for these through these years. Same thing in 2020 and 2021. And in 2020, it's the last year that we receive the valley sponsorship money. So you can see the beginning of January 1st of 2022, we're going to be short $169,000. 
and in 2023 will be short total of 495,000 and 2024 650,000. So I've put together a plan that we can fund that and if council approves this we'll be able to fund it through matured uh, debentures coming due in 2021 and 2022. So with that said the next slide the funding required is $650,000 in total to fund that all of the Valley Center debt over those years. So in 2020, we have a matured debenture of $69,000, and that'll be carried over into 2021. We'll again have that same $69,000 in that year, but we also have in 2021, 141,000 and 38,000 of matured debenture. So we're able to use those, those dollars, because they're already levied, they're already been accounted for. Of those funds that we would have, we only need $169,000 to cover us for 2021 for the Valley Center debt. That leaves us $147,000 to carry over. Again, we have the same matured debentures, uh, the 69, 141, 38. In 2022, we have to pay $326,000 out and that leaves us $69,000 at the end of 2022. We do the same for 2023, and we require $154,000, and with that paid, we, would, we will have at the end of 2023, $162,000. So unless we're able to raise more sponsorship dollars, or we're able to, um, in 2019, we will, in 2020, we're probably gonna have to um, sit down with uh, Valet and negotiate with them the extension of uh, their sponsorship and their agreement to, to be, have their name, naming rights for, the, for the, the center, the community center. And if we're able to um, negotiate that and continue the, the, uh, the funding from Valet for the naming rights, then that will obviously reduce the amount of funds that we have to require from uh, the mature debentures. But again, that still has to be worked out. But in the meantime, I would recommend that this is an approach because we don't have the funds. Instead of adding it onto the tax levy, we use existing tax levy dollars that are maturing through these debentures and fund the balance of, of that debt unless we are able to get some other additional revenues in. That's a lot to take in. Um, but Any questions? Any questions? Mr. Elliott. Thank you, Mayor. Three to Peter. So I'm going to assume that the matured uh, the ventures in 20, in 20 and 21, that's all the ventures that are maturing in those two years? Correct. So what matures in 22 and 23? Anything? The... So what we have, yeah, what we have maturing in, uh, let me get the, let me get the file. Sorry. That's okay. On page 42, so page 42 of your binder, we have in 2019, there's two matured debentures, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute as to how we may be using those funds. Um, we have uh, Pavilion, uh, the Marina, $70,000, and the Fire Hall, $307,000. And if you remember, a report came from the Fire Chief with regard to potentially using that $307,000 for, uh, for some of the fire major expenditures. In 20... Um, 2020, uh, we have $69,000 maturing, and that's that 69,000 that's on the uh, the slide. And we have 141,000 maturing, and that uh, both of those are the Main Street CIP. And in 2021, we also have um, this building's debenture maturing, which is $38,000. So that's those three numbers that we've already accounted for there. In 2022. We have a uh, fire vehicle maturing, and that's $68,000. And there are other ones maturing in probably 2025 and, and so on. And uh, that is in your binder also, the first page after the debt uh, tab. 
or second page, I believe. So what this does is provides council with an avenue to fund the uh, ongoing debenture for the valet center. It also funds the employment lands. It also funds the marina uh, debenture and has no effect on the tax levy. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> Except you're saying that the fire debenture that's coming up, you've got plans for that too, um, which yep. which is going to be an issue for me. Because you're we're going we're going to burn through and commit all maturing debt until 2022, which is which effectively eats up all the maturing debentures for the next council to cover off stuff mm -hmm. that happened during our period, their votes. And I, that to me, that that's a problem. So, so three, Mr. Mayor, um, basically you're correct. It, it does, it does tie up these funds. No question about that. Um, the only other way that you're able to do the balance of the of the valet debt is by one adding it to the tax levy or two if we're able to continue with the agreement with valet and renegotiate that for the naming rights or a new person that comes in for the naming rights or we get other other um, revenues that we talked about before which is naming rights for the two rinks, the gymnasium, and that. So we need some other sources of revenue to be generated that we can then offset this. But what I'm recommending to council is that if we don't have anything else in our back pocket yes. to offset this, this is an option for council. Doesn't mean we have to do it, but it is an option for council to cover it. Um, and yes, it does tie up those mature debentures until 2023, um, unless we were able to you know, generate some other revenues that would lower that or, or eliminate it. So just one quick question while I finish yep, chair. trying to do the, yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor. So the valet center will be owed for 2 million short, roughly, because 343 times five is 1.7 and change, say two. We're 1.9. Three, Mr. Mayor, it's, uh, it's actually $650,000 over those three years. Okay. So Mr. total, look, like the total amount owing? Correct. Oh, at, at, this is at the, at the point in time of 2020. Because right now... Okay, what's, un, what's unfunded for, for valet total? So when you say when you show we we in valet center that's a three hundred forty three thousand dollar payment for correct correct for one two three four five years and then correct. one one seventy one on on the sixth year right one two three four five three six. three Mr Mayor the from twenty eighteen to twenty twenty three that is what is owing for the owing in total for the for those for for, for the total debt so if we were to the bench of the total over 10 years. What's the cost of that? We already, three, Mr. Mayor, this was debentured over 10 years. This is the last. So if we did it, what happens if we did it? Another 10? Another 10. Because uh, what, I'm, what I'm saying is, when this was done, this was unfunded, and we were hoping to get it back through sponsorships, and we failed in the sponsorship. In reality, should actually put it on the entire debenture right at the beginning, right? This is principal and interest too. Right. This is not okay. just the uh, yeah. principal. Yeah. yeah. I, I just, it, it's, it's, I know it's keeping it off the levy, but it's tying up funds moving forward for the next term of council. There might be a little bit coming up, but especially when you say you've got other things for the other monies yeah what, I, what I'm looking at is you know we had discussed 
CIP, and we're taking all of the maturing debentures gone. Now you're looking at a CIP, which is fairly important. And we don't have any maturing debentures to fund that. Three, three, three Mr. Mayor. Three, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the 2019 debentures that are maturing um, can be, and again, these are a, a number of options for council. So we have $377,000 um, available in 2019 that initially we talked about um, using that to debenture approximately $5.5 million for the CIP along with our $6 million and along with hopefully provincial and federal funding to be able to do the full project. Again, it's going to be council's decision at, at some point in time, not tonight or this budget maybe, but at some point where what do you want to spend the $377,000 on? Is it part or whole that there's issues that the fire department requires some, some, some funding, um, which was recommended by the chief uh, to use the same, the $300,000, which was the fire hall towards some portion towards fire um, issues or matters, um, or do you use it all for the CIP? And then, depending on what is required from the fire hall, there's another plan in place of potential debenturing at that point. Uh, so there is some debenture room that that we do have, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, so we, you know, but do you want to be debenture continuing to debenture? We've debentured quite a bit in the last couple of years, um, and if you have a CIP that's the top of the priority for for council then we may want to sit back on that and see where that takes us. This plan here, with regard to the debt, we're, we definitely need to do something for, for, uh, for this year because we know that we're going to be a little short on 2018. Um, the, where am I short? Tw actually, we're good until 20, uh, 2021. 2021. So, yeah. we, you know, we have some time. But I wanted to bring this to the attention of council in that we do have something that we have to start thinking about as to how we're going to fund this coming in the next couple of years, or next term of council, basically. And, um, but there's some options that we have, and options obviously are hopefully we can get additional revenue to come in. And this is the worst case scenario that we use this type of th these funds for this because we already levied for those funds or we have to start levying for those funds now to have the funding available when we do require it in 2022. So it's food for thought that we have to really think about. Just, Mr. Mayor, if I just one quick uh, okay, question. We have more questions here, Mr. Elliott. Yeah, just uh, one quick one. When did you say naming rights were done? Naming rights are done in 2020. Couple years. It'd be, kind of, be kind of nice to have that conversation sooner than later. Just Correct. Thank you. Okay, Madam Demery, you got a question. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you uh, to Peter. <laughs> Peter, it's, it's really disturbing to hear this because I do remember um, a lot of really positive talk about how we were going to get that sponsorship and how we were going to sell the properties the the, the uh, for the old west side arena the old pool and everything we're going to apply this all to the debt none of those things happen so uh, here we are and it's several years later and we're talking about using that debt again and it just really bothers me that we we're looking forward to actually paying something off and being able to apply it to new projects that are really urgently needed like the cip um, and now we may not be able to do that. That really does bother me. And the t I think the taxpayers expect more of us. So let's get uh, really active on a new sponsorship plan. And uh, if we have to sell every inch of the boards, let's do that. Hmm. Thank you, Madam Memory. Any other questions by other members of council? There being none, go ahead, Mr. Zanes. Okay. So the next slide just to bring back our memory on, on the uh, capitals or council's capital projects ranking. Remember we did this back in 2015, I think it was. So I just wanted to give you sort of a quick status report on where these are at. 
Um, obviously, the new operations center is uh, complete. Nickel and Omer um, uh, storm sewers is nearing completion. The Roseland Heritage Building is in progress. We're doing a lot of work there right now. The Elm Street main uh, water main replacement was completed. The site servicing these site lands, uh, that's been designed, so it's ready to go. The downtown CIP is next on the list, which is pending, um, and it's pending any grant um, from uh, the federal or provincial government that we're sort of hoping and waiting that will come out this month. The uh, marina dock assessment repairs, there's a report that uh, has been uh, completed and that's going to be being brought forward to council shortly. The completion of the east waterfront CIP, I believe, is, uh, is still outstanding, Dan. We haven't, uh, that hasn't gone anywhere at this point. Uh, the master plan for the storm water and the water is completed. The ward for fire protection, that was reviewed and, and, and decided on by council. Uh, remediation transport panel lands um, is basically outstanding still is in negotiations and all that kind of stuff the culture block enhancement that's the library museum that's in progress uh, with the library and the museum working together on that and the rail on apron completion uh, is I believe still outstanding so as you can see based on the rankings the obviously the downtown CIP is, is at this point council's uh, top priority and we're sort of waiting in the wings right now and uh, hoping that we can get some some government funding to do that question question mr. Desette. thank you very much mr. mayor uh, through you to Peter I'm looking at this and I'm not seeing the storm sewer project Wellington home Humboldt Clark and Janus Street where's that because I mean it was way up there for all the years we've been here and where is it now this, I mean, uh, I, it's all been studied and it's all ready to go, is what I'm told. It's shovel ready. So, mm -hmm. yes, it's a mess. Three, Mr. Mayor. Um, when this ranking was done, it was the Nickel area was the top one for the storm sewers. Yeah. Um, so yes, I believe that those designs were completed a few years ago. Yep. And I believe once we get the storm sewer project off or the uh, storm sewer fees and all of that. Um, uh, on the books and being starting to collect those fees, mm -hmm. then that's where you're going to be able to then look at some of these storm sewers and venture for those storm sewers, get them done, and those the ventures would be paid for by the storm sewer fees. Okay. My biggest fear is that we forget that. It's been on the books for 14 years, and now it doesn't show up on here at all. So I don't want it forgotten yeah. because I keep being asked, when's it going to happen? So I just want to be, make sure that everyone is aware it is still existing and it is still an issue. Definitely. Yeah, and I believe Mr. and Mr. Mayor, engineering definitely has that on their, like it's it's in their uh, design books. Thanks, so, Mr. Do that, Mr. Sass. Okay. So moving on, uh, the we're almost done. This part of it is the uh, the venture guidelines. So. If, you remember, we have a provincial repayment limit um, of about $6 million, and that's 25% of our revenues. That's how much we can have in our budget to pay for debentures. Our, uh, the city imposed limit is 20%, which is $4.7 million. What we have our current debt right now is at almost $2.5 million, which means if we're just looking at our city imposed uh, debt limit, we can borrow and spend in our operating budget about almost $2.3 million in additional debt charges. The provincial re, uh, payment limit is, would be of almost $3.5 million. So we still have uh, you know, uh, lots of room in order for anything future coming down the road. And Councillor uh, <laughs> Elliott is laughing. Um, this includes our current debentures that we, uh, it's all up to date with regard to the debentures that we just purchased for the uh, Nickel Area Storm. Um, so we're all up to date with this, these, these numbers here. The next slide shows that we are $2.3 million is what we could be spending in, in additional uh, debentures. What that means is that we could borrow $19.5 million over 10 years. We can borrow $29 million over 20 years or $39 million over 30 years. 
our emergency debt room, I call it, which is the difference, the 5% difference between the city imposed and the provincial, is about $1.2 million. And that would equate to about $9 million of debt that we could uh, incur. So that just gives you an update as to where we are debt-wise. As far as our debt goes, you can see over the years um, where we've been with our debt. You can see in 2017 and 18 is when we've been uh, most active. And uh, so in 2017, that includes our operations center of $13.8 million and the east side employment lands of $450,000 for about a $14 million increase in our debt there. And in 2018, uh, that includes our $5.5 million for the Nickel Area Storm the marina lift and the water meters, which is about $6 million. So we're sitting at just under $30 million in, uh, in overall debt and $2.4 million, $2 million in actual uh, debt payments. Any questions of Mr. Sass? So the next slide um, is potential debentures. If you remember all well, the east uh, side employment lands, we have the design. Um, if council at some point in time approves moving uh, forward on that, and it also depends, if I'm not mistaken, on the region uh, doing some work and bringing over uh, is it the water line underneath the canal. Um, so there's some work still to be done there before any of this can take place. Um, but. $8 million is, is probably low at this point because I think that was a, that's probably a couple years old, that, that number. Uh, but with that said, um, the annual debt on that, if we had to venture that, is about $445,000. Potentially, we would have to levy some of that, which is about between 2019 and 2022, about $129,000 or $32,000 a year. And I put a note there that we could potentially use the mature debt for 2020, 2021, 22, but obviously we can't use it in two places. That's why I have the note there that um, we may be, uh, it may be, this project may be a 2022 or 2023 project if the mature debentures are applied and used for the valet debt over 2021 and 2023. So there's where we have to make some decisions or a future council or this council next year when they get into the term is looking at this type of thing and determining, okay, where are we going to spend that money? Um, is this something that we want to make sure that we have available for the employment lands or are we using it for the venture debt? Do we have other funds available for the debenture debt? And then therefore this can be done in 2020, 2022. So those are just some future decisions that are going to, that are going to have to be made. The downtown CIP, I mentioned uh, the $377,000. It's coming uh, maturing in 2019. Um, again, that may be used for fire capital requirements or it could be used for the downtown CIP. Uh, $5.5 million is about a $300,000 uh, debt on it. And we have the, in the capital reserve the $6 million and potential government grants. So again, those are decisions that aren't going to be made today, but are decisions that we have to keep in our back of our mind that we're going to have to look at as to how we want to plan for some of these uh, um, developments and capital projects. Questions on that? Any questions, Council? But if you're not, Mr. Sonnes. Okay. So to finish off, this is my last slide on this, is... Um, this is just a comparison of our overall residential tax. So with our, uh, just to come back now to our operating, um, as a summary, with 3.27% tax levy increase, it's about a 0.78% overall levy, overall tax increase, or $24. Adding in the 200,000 capital and the $130,000 um, uh, debenture for the op center, it, we are then at a tax levy increase of 5.33%, which equates to about a 2% um, overall, or 1.78% overall tax increase, which is about $54. And I mentioned before, if, we, if the region has a tax ratio change, 
that could increase from 1.78 to 2% or $61. Again, if council approves everything that, uh, that staff are requesting or have on that list, the $200,000, that raises our levy increase to 6.5% or 2.39% of a tax increase on a blended, um, uh, blended tax with uh, region school boards in the city or $72. And if, again, the uh, region has a, a tax ratio change, it could potentially go up to about 2.64% of a tax increase, which is about $80, which is less than last year's tax increase of $84, I believe it was. So that sort of summarizes where we're at, where this budget's going, and um, essentially going forward, Mr. Mayor, uh, once we get into... Um, the uh, the budget next or tomorrow night, we're starting with that 5.3 percent levy increase, which is a 1.78 percent tax increase overall, and um, and then it'll be council's decisions as to what items you may want to put on the levy or not put on the levy, and so we'll be somewhere in between there. Um, as far as the capital goes, the uh, all of the capital uh, requests of staff um, are funded one way or another through either the capital levy or grants or um, so you, you just have to look at those and decide if there's any there that you want to raise to discuss and uh, then we can uh, uh, staff can uh, provide explanations and um, and hopefully we can uh, both work on operating and capital and um, and come up with a reasonable uh, budget to uh, go forward for 2018. That is the end Thank of the presentation, Mr. Mayor. Uh, you uh, sort of encapsulate a lot of information in uh, very understandable terms. Does council have any questions? There be none. Uh, is it your intention then to discontinue until tomorrow night, Mr. Sonnets? Uh, three, Mr. Mayor. I would, uh, depends on, on council as to whether or not they want to start looking at anything this evening or if they want to start fresh tomorrow night um, by going through the uh, operating uh, requests of council or, or requests from staff. Uh, so I leave it up to council's uh, decision as to whether or not they want to continue or, or uh, adjourn for tomorrow. I would suggest we might start to fresh tomorrow. What is the feeling of council? It would appear that there is consensus for that opinion okay i think we'll start fresh tomorrow night thank you very much uh, and at this point unless there's nothing further i'd uh, call for a motion to adjourn okay. council dent thank you very much seconder yeah mr elliott all in favor approved thank you very much for your attendance and members of staff as well. People want to leave their stuff in here and that's okay.